of turning with thee. Good evening. It is good to have you with us on this Wednesday night, uh, and hopefully you have uh, had a great week so far, and uh, looking for the Lord to speak to each of us tonight uh, as we talk about um, the posture of prayer, and so hopefully uh, this will help you get uh, more in tune with what God wants us to, to bring to Him and to uh, let Him know through prayer. And uh, if you watch any part of the news, which I try not to, uh, very much anyway, um, you can tell very quickly this world is spinning out of control, uh, at least to us. But God holds everything in His hand, and He is still on the throne, and uh, there is not one thing that can knock him off that throne. There is not one thing that can remove or change who he is. And so I'm reminded in Philippians as we get ready to sing this evening to uh, not worry about anything. And for some of us, that is easier than others. Uh, but in everything, let our request be made known to God. So let's stand together tonight and let's, with that thought in mind, sing Sweet Hour of Prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known in sea. Tonight we come to you singing and praying, Lord, that you would help us sense your movement around us tonight. Father, with everything that's going on in this world, may we take this time to focus on you. May we be able to uh, present our petitions to you. May we be able to honor and adore you. Father, may we be thankful for the things that you have uh, done for us. Father, tonight may we be thankful for uh, your word. 
May we be thankful for the truth that it contains. And Father, I pray that our hearts would be open. Father, I pray for those that are listening here in this room or watching online. Father, for those that are seeking truth, may tonight be the night that they realize you are uh, truth. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And Father, because of that, may we be reminded that no one can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ, uh, our Lord and Savior. Tonight, Father, in that truth, may we be thankful for what Christ has done for us, for the sacrifice that he made on the cross, for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, may we be thankful tonight for that gift of eternal life that you have provided us through your Son, Jesus Christ, because of his sacrifice. And tonight, Father, as we focus on prayer, may you continue to reveal to us the one that we should be sharing that truth with. Father, tonight as we gather together, we ask that our hearts be open uh, and be receptive to what your Spirit has to tell us. In thy name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, Derek, for the song and for the prayer as we uh, have a discussion tonight about prayer. Uh, again, you can turn your Bibles, if you want to, to Matthew chapter 6. But this is going to be one of those where I'm going to be all over the place, so you can try to take notes, or you can uh, wait and watch it on YouTube a little bit later on. That way you can slow it down. Uh, but we want to uh, study a little bit about prayer tonight and have a sweet hour of prayer together as we do that. Uh, we start off talking about the posture of prayer. Uh, we received an email with the following question. It says, I bow my head and close my eyes when someone is praying, but I know several people who do not, which kind of means, how does she know that if her head is bowed and her eyes are closed? But anyway, um, but I mean, I know, I know where she's going with it. Is it important to bow your head and close your eyes when praying or when someone else is praying? And I know the posture of prayer things comes up from time to time. Uh, I've been doing uh, this ministry thing for a while, and uh, I get to hear about what's the proper posture of prayer. Um, uh, in church meetings, you often hear pastors like myself call people to prayer by saying, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to ask every head to be bowed and every eye to be closed. And the question is, is where, did, where did that originate? Where did that request come from? Is there a command in the Bible that says, when we pray, our heads should be bowed and our eyes closed? I know in some churches there are kneelers built into the rail at the front of the sanctuary where during the invitation time, if you want to come down, you can kneel and pray. Uh, Laura and I even belonged to a church when we were in the Army. Um, it, was, it was off base down in Columbus, Georgia, and they actually had kneelers on the back of every pew so that you could stay where you at, roll the kneeler forward and uh, get down on your knees and pray uh, while you were sitting in the pew there. Um, some people pray with their hands joined together like this. Uh, some people I've seen pray with their hands extended out in front of them like this, and some of them with their arms raised over their head. Uh, King Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 8, we're told is dead, when he dedicated the temple, the Bible says he stood when he prayed and spread out his hands toward the heavens. So something like this whenever he offered the prayer for the people of Israel. Of course, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he knelt down and prayed, the Bible says. So the question for the evening is, what is the most effective uh, posture for prayer? Um, I once heard the story about a priest, a pastor, and a guru who were discussing the best position for prayer uh, while a telephone repairman was working in the office where they were at. And... Uh, so the discussion went something like this. Uh, the priest said, kneeling is the, definitely the best way to pray. And the pastor said, no, I get best results from standing with my hands outstretched toward heaven. And then the guru said, well, you both are wrong. The most effective prayer position is laying face down on the floor uh, before God. And the repairman, he couldn't help himself. He said, hey, fellas, the best praying I ever did was when I was hanging upside down on a telephone pole. So... <laughs> So, so, I guess a, lo a lot of different positions can uh, get you to where you're praying more uh, fervently than others. Uh, but with every head bowed and every eye closed, where did that come from? Is there a command in the Bible uh, that tells us to do that? Uh, but actually, when we get to prayer, Jesus taught his disciples to pray. You see that in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, he taught them what to say, but he did not give them the position in which to pray. 
Uh, he did tell them how not to pray. If you have Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they left to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. So that's not the way to pray. So how are we, what position should we take in order to pray? Uh, when we study the life of Jesus, we see a number of these. In Matthew 14, 19, he was feeding the 5,000, and it says he looked up to heaven, and then he blessed the bread. He offered uh, th a prayer of thanksgiving before his heavenly Father. Um, Mark chapter 7, verse 34, Jesus was healing a deaf person who was deaf and mute, and he looked up to heaven, and he said, Epaphtha, and then said, which means be opened. And then, of course, the miracle took place there. Uh, apparently, Jesus was not unique in praying that way with his uh, eyes and arms lifted up. Psalm 28, 2 from the Old Testament says, Hear the voice of my supplication when I cry to you, O Lord, when I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary. So this person was obviously lifting hands when they prayed. 1 Timothy 2, 8, I desire that men everywhere pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath, wrath and doubting. And I remember, I guess the first guy I've ever saw pray like that was my church history professor. Uh, whenever he'd lead us in prayer before class, he'd always lift his hands like this and, uh, and offer his prayer before the Lord. So uh, Matthew 26, 39, in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says Jesus fell on his face and prayed. In Luke 22, 41, talking about Gethsemane, it said Jesus knelt down and prayed. And of course, he went back and forth three times, if you remember, so I guess he did a variety of things there. So we have Jesus praying, standing with his eyes open, looking up, and his hands lifted up. We also see Jesus praying, kneeling down, or all the way down on his face, praying to his heavenly Father. So where did this idea of heads bowed, eyes closed come from? Well, about the only place I could find that in the Bible was the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. If you remember that in Luke chapter 18 and verse 10, and it says, Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank you I'm not like that guy. Uh, he was standing while he was praying, and it said he said within himself, God, I thank you I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And then the Lord looks over to the tax collector who said he stood afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes toward heaven, which means that his head was bowed, and beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than that other guy, the Pharisee, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And I think that last verse there is probably the kicker. And that is, whenever you pray, however you pray, we should come before the Lord with a humble attitude, a humble heart. Attitude, I think, is more important than the posture or the ritual. 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22 says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed or listen better than the fat of rams. So again, what the Lord is saying there, even in Old Testament times, is your attitude is more important than just performing the ritual. Again, Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. So again, when we come to the Lord in prayer, he's looking to see if we're humble if we're serious about our talk with him, if we come with a broken heart, a contrite spirit. Again, uh, the prophet Joel in chapter 2 and verse 12. Now therefore says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping, with mourning. So rend your heart or tear your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger and of great kindness. He will relent from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. In those days, one of the ways that you showed repentance was by tearing your clothes. You'd take your top of your, well, they didn't really have shirts like we have now, but they had a piece of cloth with a hole in the top, and they would tear it open like that uh, to show that they were repenting. But Joel was aware that people could tear their clothes as a show of repentance, but at the heart level, continue to sin and not change at all. And so that's why he said the, 
the Lord would prefer that you come with a broken heart more than to tear your garments or try to make some show of repentance. So again, it's a humble attitude is more important than the posture or ritual. But I got to tell you, I do think posture does help with attitude because while we can pray from any posture, I believe a submissive outside posture motivates us toward a humble inward attitude. Um, I mean, whenever you decide to pray before the Lord and you're getting in a mood to say, which mood best says, speak, Lord, for your servant hears, if you're kneeling beside your bed or if you're stretched out in a lazy boy. You know, I, th I think uh, when, when you bow down and you're on your knees, I think you're, you're more likely to have your heart in that position than you are if you're trying to sleep while you're laying in the bed. Now, of course, there again, I've been in ICU before, and how many of you know you can pray in ICU laying in a bed? Um, so again, it all comes down to the attitude, I think. You know, as Americans, we uh, tend to be too casual, I believe, uh, in our working with the Lord, but we have a historical tradition in our country of not bowing before kings, uh, because if you remember, our country was founded in rebellion, and rightly so, uh, because for centuries, uh, kings and queens had claimed divine right, which means they believed that since they were kings and queens that God was the one who had made them royal, and because of that, these kings and queens uh, uh, in Europe in general and in England in particular uh, usurped the authority of God some even to the point of calling themselves head of the church can you imagine that arrogance anybody know who the head of the church is Jesus Christ yeah so for you to be a human being I don't care how high uppity you think you are and to call yourself the head of the church one that comes to mind was Henry VIII who had all kinds of other problems as well uh, but anyway um, these royals begin to ignore the needs of the people and continually oppress the colonists in our case here, resulting in the American Revolution. Uh, however, and I believe it was justified, uh, but uh, somewhere along the way, I think many Americans have thrown out the baby with the bathwater, and we no longer bow to anyone, including God. And that's the problem, because if you do a word study, and you can do it either by Bible on computer or just do it the old-fashioned way with a concordance. Just look at how many times you see the word bow, bowing, or bowed, and look that up, and you'll see that uh, in a human sense it meant a servant uh, would bow before his or her master, uh, showing reverence or humility or loyalty or commitment to service. And then it naturally followed that bowing down became part of our worship, became part of our prayer, because if we would bow and show reverence to a high-ranking human, why would we not bow down before the Lord of all creation, before the, uh, our Lord and Savior, our King of kings and Lord of lords? Uh, matter of fact, where it all comes together is there's a verse in the psalm, Psalm 95, 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord God, our Maker. Do you hear it? It all came together there, bowing before the Lord. And, uh, and showing uh, the respect that, that we have for him. So uh, I think it's okay for every knee to bow because ultimately the Bible says the time is coming at the end of the age when what? Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so I think it's okay and proper to bow the knee, to bow the head, to close our eyes. Um, the next thing is where did the hand clasp originate? Some people pray like this, some people pray like that. You know, where did we come up with, with that idea? Well, it turns out, I don't think anybody knows, but there are several theories out there traveling around uh, some of those historical sites on the Internet. One said that from ancient time, prisoners of war, after their surrender, would always have their hands tied together in front of them, so that was forced submission. And then later on, hands clasped together was a sign of surrender, kind of like waving the white flag. It means I'm not going to fight anymore. You know, I'm giving myself up. And then by medieval times, uh, placing one's uh, joint hands together in the hand of a feudal lord uh, was a sign of fidelity and loyalty. And so uh, it meant, you know, if I'm uh, one of the low-level low guys and the guy who is the feudal lord of this particular county in England came along, and I met him, I'd put my hands together, and then I'd put them in his hands, and that would show that I am loyal to him, I am his servant, I'm willing to serve him. And so when we fold our hands in prayer, we're symbolically pledging to God our surrender, our fidelity, our loyalty, 
our faithfulness, our love, and placing our hands in his hands, just like they did all those years ago. But, you know, after studying the Bible for a few years, um, I'm convinced that what prayer is is simply communicating with God. And for sinful people to be able to communicate, speak with a holy God, it requires faith in God's Son, Jesus Christ, who made our prayer possible through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. He's the one that paid for us to be reconciled to that holy God. And then the Bible says he also stands at the right hand of the Father where he ever intercedes for us. So Jesus Christ is the one who makes prayer possible. And that's, uh, that's how it all works. Our prayers go to God the Father, in the name of God the Son, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So how many of you knew that in order for your prayer to reach heaven, you've got to go through the Trinity? You know, still people out there don't believe in the Trinity, but that's what the Bible teaches, that we pray to God the Father in the name of God the Son and by the power of God the Spirit. So our prayers can be offered anywhere, any place, anytime, any posture. Uh, in the Bible, we are exhorted and encouraged to be having a constant attitude of prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, Pray without ceasing. How do you do that? I hope, how many of you pray when you're driving? Especially in Atlanta, you've got to be praying while you're driving. But, and uh, so I guess that means that we can pray without closing our eyes, right? I, I hope if you're meeting me on the highway, you've got your eyes open. So yes, you can, you can do it. We're supposed to be in a constant attitude of prayer. Uh, the Bible refers to this as walking with God. Remember, I guess the first character that that was mentioned of was Enoch in the Old Testament said he walked with God and was not. Why? Because God took him. I don't know about you, but I'd rather do that than die and have to go through the whole funeral thing. Wouldn't you just be walking with God one day? And then he said, just come on up with me. Just come on home. That's what it means to have a close personal relationship with God, walking with God. There was a 17th century monk named Brother Lawrence and he called it practicing the presence of God. Do you do that? Just in your daily life? Uh, sometimes I think we, we locate God in the church, and so we pray on Wednesday night and we pray on Sunday. But no, we need to practice the presence of God that he is here. How many of you think he is here? And when you go out there, he is still here. And wherever you go, he is there. And so one of the things that made Brother Lawrence unique, I guess, is because somewhere in all of his uh, prayer and study he didn't realize that the only place that he could pray was when it came time in this monastery to go to the church and go in there and kneel down and pray he said I pray wherever I am uh, apparently they gave him the task of washing dishes so in that little booklet he never wrote the booklet somebody came and interviewed him and wrote the book called practicing the presence of God he said I can practice the presence of God when I'm washing dishes or when I'm putting food out on the serving line, or when I'm serving the other monks as they come down the line to get there. You know, all these uh, are prayers, offering, and worship to the Lord. So he practiced the presence of God. Uh, another great Christian, Christian pastor and writer, uh, A.W. Tozer, wrote, The goal of every Christian should be to live a life in a state of unbroken worship. Wow, think about that for a minute. We're, we're worshiping here. But when we go out the door, we're still worshiping. When we get in our car and go home, we're still worshiping. When we go to work tomorrow, we're still worshiping. That should be the goal, unbroken worship, to realize that God is there and we're practicing his presence and we're walking with God. Of course, in addition to having that continual thing, the Bible does speak that we should have special times of prayer in our life as well. Psalm fifty-five, seventeen: evening, morning, and at noon will I pray. So, of course, that was David, and he had special times of the day. When he first got up in the morning, he would begin with a prayer. When he went to bed at night, he would put a prayer in there, and when he took a break for the middle of the day to have a meal, he would pray again there. Other special times are Sabbaths, Lord's Day, the assembly of the church when we all get together, humble ourselves before the Lord and pray. We pray while we're standing, sitting, kneeling, praying while our heads are bowed or whether they're lifted up, praying whether our eyes are open or closed, praying while our hands are clasped together 
or our palms are opened up and lifted up or hands being used to serve the Lord to help somebody else. The posture is probably related to the content of our prayers. If you're celebrating and praising the Lord, what do you think you'll do with your hands? Probably that. All right. And, but if you're brokenhearted and repentant and things are not going right in your life, then we're more likely, what, to bow our head, put our hands together, and offer a fervent prayer uh, before the Lord. And just so you know, uh, occasionally in, in the invitation, I say, bow your heads and close your eyes. You know why I do that? It's to encourage timid souls to come to the Lord. Anybody want to know what the number one fear of people is? It's what I'm doing right here, standing in front of people. And so that keeps a lot of people from making that step is because they don't want to be in front of people. And so sometimes all we do is ask you, to, especially if I see somebody who I think is under conviction, a lot of time I'll just say, if you'll bow your head and close your eyes, and we'll wait and see if this person will put, come and put their faith and trust in the Lord. We ought to pray as Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> I've uh, simplified it. I came across this uh, years ago, a prayer guide called ACTS, A-C-T-S. Uh, for those of you that's taken a new member class, you probably remember uh, that we had an ACTS prayer guide that we offered you in there. That's uh, one of them that I put together years ago. Uh, I don't know about you, but I need a prayer guide. How many of y'all need a prayer guide? When, Because if you don't have a prayer guide, guess what happens? Your mind wanders. It takes off in places, and you say, well, what am I doing? I'm thinking instead of praying, so i got to get back. So, uh, so I think a prayer guide helps, keeps us on, on topic and keeps our mind wandering into daydreaming. When I'm having my quiet time with the Lord, I look at it like a staff meeting. I remember years ago when I was in business and I'd have to go meet with the boss. Uh, I would go in there. I'd usually have some things listed I need to talk to him about. And then I'd have two or three blank pages for what? For what he was going to tell me. <laughs> so, so anyway, and, that, and that's kind of what we do when we get with the Lord. I have a staff meeting with the Lord. I have some things on my mind that I want to share with him. But most of all, you have some blank pages there where you let him talk to you and tell you what he wants to do uh, with you in your life. ACTS, again, is an acronym. A stands for adoration. Uh, like the Lord's Prayer says, Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. So again, you start off by oh, adoring God for who he is. C stands for confession of sins. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. See, it runs right along with the Lord's Prayer. T is for thanksgiving for what God has done for us in the past, which gives us confidence that he's going to listen to us as we pray for him in the present about the future. And then, of course, S is a big word called supplication, where basically you just ask God for things. You ask God to provide our daily bread. You also ask God for protection, to uh, uh, protect us from temptation by the evil one. Uh, you'll notice uh, as I go through my prayer guide tonight that it's made up of a lot of Scripture. And I believe in the power of praying from Scripture because if our prayer is written in Scripture, then we know that we're thinking God's thoughts. But if you don't pray according to Scripture, sometimes you'll find yourself getting into what I call gimme lists. Give me this, give me that. Has that ever happened to you? Instead of praying, you know, following a, a, a way of praying before the Lord, you find yourself getting off into the gimme's Kind of like the old Janis Joplin song, Oh Lord, Won't You Buy Me? A Mercedes Benz. My friends all drive porches. I must make amends. I worked hard all my lifetime. No help from my friends. So Lord, won't you buy me a mercy? And we, we pray that way. Oh, Lord, I need this. I need that. Will you give me this? Will you give me that? Second verse is she said, Won't you buy me a color TV? And so, you know, and, and so the list goes on of these things that really don't matter. So I encourage you to pray biblical prayers. And if you pray biblical prayers, then you don't end up getting mad at God half as often because you say, hey, well, I asked him for this. He didn't give it to me. Well, again, take your burdens to the Lord in a staff meeting format. Pray his prayers. Use his words. Use his thoughts. And so we're going to do this for the next few minutes. And we're going to finish up this sweet hour of prayer. Whenever you begin your quiet time, a great place to start is Psalm 1914. O Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart 
be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Isn't that a great way to start? I said, Lord, whatever I say today, I want it to be perfectly in line with your will for my life and what you're trying to accomplish around me. And then you go to A, which is adoration, where you praise the Lord for who he is. We'll get down to what he does for you later. That's called thanksgiving. Adoration is where you just thank him for being who he is, for being the God that he chose to be. And again, from the Lord's Prayer, that's our Father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. Uh, years ago, I was reading through the Old Testament, and I found what I thought was a great prayer of adoration that King David wrote. First Chronicles 29, 10. Blessed are you, O God, uh, of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty, for all that's in heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Does that sound like adoration? I think he was fired up about adoring the Lord. And that's where we need to start with our prayers. Start off adoring God for who he is. And then next we move on to confession. That's where you, uh, again, the, the Greek word, New Testament word for confession simply means to agree. It means to agree with God concerning our sin and ask him for forgiveness. And when you start this confession, don't be quibbling with him. Don't make excuses. Don't do like we hear in the press, oh, I misspoke, you know, instead of saying, I'm sorry, I said something stupid. You say, oh, I misspoke, or I'm sorry if I did anything wrong. No, agree with God that he is right and I was wrong. That's what confession means. And that's where we go with that. Again, Matthew 6, 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's important to know when you're praying this part here. If I don't get myself squared away with God, what I say the rest of the way is really not going to matter because he's not on speaking terms with me. I need to confess my sin and become at peace with him. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's a phrase in the old book of common prayer, I don't know, I'd be afraid to look at the modern book of common prayer from some of these denominations. But anyway, the old timers used to say, Oh, merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we left undone. See, so confessing both the sins of commission, where I knew this is wrong and I went and did it anyway, and the sins of omission, these are things I should have done that I didn't get done, that I should have been doing for you. And that's what confession is all about. Then we'll move on to T, which is thanksgiving. That's where you praise the Lord for the things he has done. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you. Everything? Everything? Yeah, both the good times and the bad times. Give thanks. Why? Because Romans 8, 28, that we know all things... Work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. All things, the things that we think are good, the things that we think are bad, God is working all these things together for our good. So we need to be thankful. S, supplication, that simply means making prayer requests to God for ourselves and for others. For provision, the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread and also for protection. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Usually supplication can be broken down into two parts, petition and intercession. Petition is where you make personal requests. Is it okay to pray for yourself? Doesn't that seem a little selfish? But no, the Bible says you're supposed to pray for yourself. Ask the Lord. Talk to him about all the needs you have. The famous prayer of Jabez, 1 Chronicles 4.10. Jabez prayed, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from all evil, that I may not cause pain. And the next verse says, And God granted what he requested. He prayed for blessings so that he could be a blessing. 
It's interesting, the Hebrew word Jabez actually means to cause pain. Apparently, he was named that by his mother. And so, and so he ended up praying that I would not cause pain. I, I won't live up to my name, that I won't be a pain to people. Instead, I'll be a blessing to people. So again, he prayed for himself. Philippians 4, 6, worry about nothing, pray about everything, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. Ephesians 5, 18, empty me of my selfishness and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Personal prayer that we need to pray every day. John 15, 5, Lord, without you I can do nothing. But Philippians 4, 13 says that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So I'm praying for yourself. And then we move on to intercession. Intercession is where you make requests for others. And that's when you pull out the prayer list from North Lake Baptist Church and you start praying through that list for these people who have asked us to pray for them. And for those of you who are got the technology out there and you get our email prayer list, when those come through, uh, you'll take a second and pray. Say, Lord, and usually they're very small, very brief. And so you just pray. So this person's asked me to pray for them today. So, Lord, you know their situation better than I do, and I pray that you bless them. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, it tells us it's actually a sin against God not to pray for one another. That's what uh, Samuel said. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. So we have a responsibility to pray for others. I have a list that uh, I have in my prayer guide that we, again, share with our new member class. We start off praying for the world. Matthew 6, 10, that your kingdom will come your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Psalm 122.6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Why should we pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Because there will be no peace in Jerusalem until the Prince of Peace comes. So in effect, what we're doing is we're praying, even so, come Lord Jesus. How many of you, is that your plan? You didn't come yesterday, Lord, so what? I expect you today. He's going to come one of these days. And so we need to pray for our world uh, that would be ready. While you're praying for the world, pray for world missions. Pray for our missionaries that are going into all the world. Uh, again, um, online, uh, I go to, when I, Sunday morning, when I tell you what the IMB, the uh, International Mission Board, is asking us to pray for, I go to their website, imb.org, and you see prayer list. And it tells you the latest things coming off the mission field that uh, our missionaries are out there asking for prayer. And also, before you finish, you need to pray, Lord, and help me to remember that I too am a missionary. And help me as I go out into my world today uh, that I'll be uh, a shining light for you. We're supposed to pray for our government leaders, whether you like them or not. 1 Timothy 2.1, I encourage that prayers be made for all men, for kings, for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet, peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And you say, now, Brother Danny, even if they're doing evil especially if they're doing evil. Pray to God for them, that the Lord would turn them around. I know right now our president's not doing real well in the polls. You still pray for him with some of the crazy things that's coming out of Washington? Yes, you pray for him. Because you know back when 1 Timothy chapter 2 was written, you know who was on the throne then? Nero. There's never been a more wicked man to sit on the throne when Paul wrote that we should pray for kings and all those who are in authority. So yes, that means we have to pray for our leaders as well. Even if you're living in Babylon, and folks, the way America is looking right now, the USA is looking more like Babylon every day. But even there, Jeremiah 29, 7 says, Seek the peace of the city where I've caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. So we pray that even though it looks like everything's turning around, we're going away from our christian roots that this country is founded on we still pray for our world leaders our national leaders and our local leaders because in their peace that's how you and i have peace so we pray to the lord uh, to turn them around and help them to make good decisions we pray for the church pray for north lake pray for other churches in our area ephesians 3 20 now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations. So we pray for North Lake that God might be glorified in what we do here. 
uh, that the Lord may, uh, may show his glory. Pray for our families. Help us to learn as we pray. John 15, 17, to love one another. It's the biggest problem we've got in our families now is we don't love one another. Our love grows cold. Um, also, how many of you know Satan is, is uh, majoring in destroying families right now? He loves to cause families to sin. He loves to expose family sins. But 1 Peter 4, 8 says what? Love, agape kind of love, covers a multitude of sin. So we pray for the families in our church. We pray for our own family uh, that we would learn better to love one another. 1 Peter chapter 3 says, Spouses should love and honor one another so that your prayers are not hindered. Sometimes, sometimes husbands and wives aren't getting along. You wonder why our prayers don't go above the ceiling. Well, we need to get along with our spouses. Pray for our children. Psalm 127.3, children are the heritage of the Lord. Mark 10.14, help us to encourage the little children to come unto me. Remember that's what Jesus said, allow the little children to come unto me. We pray that uh, our children and our family and the children in our church family would be encouraged to come to Jesus at an early age. Pray for our youth. How many of you know it's tough being a youth? How many of you remember it was tough being a youth when you went through that as well? Even more so now, I think, thanks to all the electronics. Ecclesiastes 12.1, remember now the Creator in the days of their youth. Need to remember to pray for them that they might see it. How many of you know there's a lot of distraction out there right now? It makes the youth turn away from the Lord, turn away from the church, turn away from their parents. So let's pray for our youth that they would remember their creator in the days of their youth before the difficult days come. What difficult days are coming for youth? It's called the law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. I've heard people say before, well, I was just sowing my wild oats. You know the problem with wild oats? They come up too. So whether they're tame ones or whether they're wild ones, they all grow. So before those tough days come, Lord, we pray that you captivate the heart of our youth and that they make wise decisions even at young age. Spiritual warfare. Psalm chapter 20. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 34. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Remember Jesus praying for Peter. Satan has asked for you that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. Romans 8, 37. We've been made more than conquerors through him who loved us. So we can win this spiritual battle. We just don't need to give in to Satan. We need to fight the spiritual battle on our knees in prayer. Anyone in here depressed tonight? Do you know that you actually can pray for people who are depressed, including yourself? Psalm 46, 1 is one of my favorites when I get down. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in a time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. 2 Timothy 1, 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So again, when you feel that depression, that dark cloud coming over you, call upon the name of the Lord. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all of our cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. For the sick folks that we know, we're fixing to put them on a prayer list here in just a little bit. Uh, there are plenty of verses about praying for the sick. James 5, the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Look at Psalm chapter 6 and you pray, have mercy on Joe or whoever it is for he is weak heal him for he is sick restore him so he can praise you Psalm 85 Lord show us your mercy grant us your salvation we will wait for you to speak for you will speak peace to your people I pray that a lot of times with people in the hospital who are uh, going through and the diagnosis is not clear they really don't know what's wrong with them they're still waiting and so we say well, let's just pray to the Lord and he'll give us an answer of peace just be at peace because the Lord's in charge of this thing. Psalm 103, your word says we can call upon you in your name to forgive our sins, to heal our sicknesses, and to renew our strength. Oh, it just goes on. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, your grace is sufficient for us. 
your strength is greater than our weakness. Hebrews 13, 5. God, we thank you for your promise that you never fail us or forsake us, but you go with us through all the things that we face in life. 3 John chapter 1. I pray that they may prosper in all things and be in good health even as their soul prospers. So pray for the sick. There's another one that we pray, and we pray for that every Sunday morning. That is for the lost. Romans 10.1. My heart's desire and prayer to God for blank is that they might be saved. And then we find out who is our one over here on the wall. We plug in their name there. We pray for them, and we seek opportunities to lead them to Christ. Hopefully you don't have to do this, and I've done it too many times, and that's pray for the dying. Psalm 23, I always try to read over these before I get to the house when I've been called that somebody is very low. Psalm 23, I pray, thank you, God, for being the shepherd of our souls, not only in life, but also when we're in the valley of the shadow of death. We thank you, God, for the blessed hope we find in Psalm chapter 30. Weeping may endure for a night, but what? Joy comes in the morning when you wake up on the other side. Psalm 31 offers us the prayer that Jesus prayed from the cross. Into your hand we commit our spirit. Psalm 68. To you belongs all the issues of life. From birth to death to beyond. God's in charge of all those issues. Psalm 116. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of your saints. John 16.20. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus who turns our sorrow into joy. Romans 8, thank you, God, for your promise that neither life nor death nor principalities nor powers anything present anything to come will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if you need a blessing, how many of y'all need a blessing? Everybody wants a blessing tonight. Numbers chapter 6, verse 24, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. What does it mean for the Lord to lift up his countenance? You're asking him to smile at you. How many of you want the Lord to smile at you? Uh, when he does that, that's where you get the blessing. In John chapter 15 and verse 16, Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, in my name, he will give it to you. And that's why we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Was that a sweet hour of prayer? Amen. Well, let's continue to pray. Father, we thank you for this day that you've blessed us with. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of prayer. We thank you, Lord, that even though your word gives us special times of prayer and also even special postures of prayer, we thank you, Lord, that once we're saved and we've been reconciled with you and your Holy Father, that wherever we're at, whatever position we're in, that we can communicate with you, we can practice your presence, we can walk with you, we can live with you, and offer our prayers before you with full confidence that you hear us and that you will bless according to your goodwill and purpose. Lord, we thank you for the, for the privilege of prayer. Help us, Lord, not to neglect it. It's so easy to do in the busy world in which we live. But Lord, bless us as we continue to pray to you and offer service to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.